Right, today is chapter 8, yeah? chapter 8, page 156. Now today we're going to do two short suttas from chapter 8 called the Kutagara Suttas. The discourses on the pinnacle house. So this house has got a kind of like a tower above it. Sometimes the word is translated as a gable house, a house with, with gable uh, roofs. That means the, a kind of like a roof jutting out over a window. So the, the two parables here, okay, uh, A3.105 and 3.106. So they're kind of interrelated. Now, although the theme of this volume 48 is on death, we have two suttas here which, are, which seem not to be related to death, but it's about keeping your mind calm, keeping your mind wholesome. You know? The wholesome mind is very important. Okay? Uh, whether the situation is happy or sad, we've got to keep this mind wholesome, we've got to keep this mind calm. Uh, for various reasons, okay, because only when the mind is calm and clear, we'll be able to get things done, properly done, in a safe and happy way. Sometimes even our loved ones will pass away, and that's when, of course, we can't have feeling sad. But if you are a true practitioner, you, you know these things happen, and your mind is calm knowing that your loved one has lived a full life, or at least you have done what you can for your loved one. And now it comes, the time comes as your duty to say goodbye to this person. So we welcome people into the world, we welcome babies, we're very happy. When the baby is born, the baby cry, and we look at the baby, we all laugh. Ne? Now is a time when this person, he dies happily and, and we are the ones looking at this person, we are the ones crying. So the, other, the roles are switched. Eh? So, in a sense, in, in Buddhism we say there is no such thing as death because this person is already reborn elsewhere. We do some kind of what's called prayers because we do not know what exactly happened. Only for one occasion that we, we need, we can, with, proper, with a proper wholesome mind, help the passage of this person onward to a happier level, so to speak. Yeah? That is when this person is still caught up with the world, still attached to this world, uh, caught in, in between state or uh, in other words, has difficulty moving on. They're still clinging, craving for this life. It's just like, you know, we have this long-term guest with us, and then the time has come for this guest to leave, and this guest is, is so happy here, it is quite reluctant to leave. We are quite reluctant to let this person go. So, so there's this long goodbye at, at the doorstep, so to speak. So basically, we just got to say goodbye to this person so that our own life can move on and this person also can move on to a new life. Then our, then our turn comes and then we are reborn, you know. So this is the final act of letting go in this life, if you like, okay? to, to send off the loved one. In a sense, we should send off happily also, just as we have welcomed this person happily into this world. Not that we are happy to see the person go, but rather we have happy memories of this person. And when you create these happy memories for, for this person to, to live, the person will happily be reborn. There's a bit of uh, controversy over the, what's called the last thought. Okay? At, at least one monk in Malaysia, a living monk, a very good teacher, I'm happy that he said this. His view is that it is unlikely that when we die, our last thought moment is the deciding factor. At least two reasons. Number one is that the suttas doesn't say this. Not clearly anyway. 
The only clear statement we seem to have is in the Melinda Panha, which is written hundreds of years after the Buddha passed away. His argument is that how can a person who has lived for you know his whole life as a good person, and he dies an unhappy thought, and how can he be reborn in a suffering state because he has done so much good? And there are also suttas where the Buddha says people who do good things, their rebirth is sure to be a good one, right? So in other words, if you habitually do good things, your death will be a good one too. You'll be reborn happily, in other words. In fact, today's sutta says just that too. Of course, uh, we may have some unhappy thoughts when, when, when we die. And if that is aggravated by lots of unhappy actions early on in our life, yeah, that perhaps may push us on to, some, to an unhappy state. It's possible, but I'm not saying that it is certain. So just assuming that someone has passed away and then it's kind of lingering, still stuck halfway. Once, if you're stuck halfway, it's very unhappy. It's like you are caught in a dream. All the time it's a dream, you know. It's not, it's not real. So we build up our loving kindness, we, we calm ourselves, we, we fill ourselves with joy, and then we come out of that state, we say, okay, I'm happy for you, I am sharing this energy, I'm dedicating this energy, I'm feeling this way for you, I'm happy for you. Now imagine if someone talks to you like that, you feel good, so you feel this person has a very happy, positive attitude towards you, you feel good. So these, these, these beings, so called in-between beings, the, the being born into intermediate state, or this preta even, which is very attached to a place, a thing, a person, they feel happy. Now when they feel happy, they fall off from their suffering state. That's how it works. Then they move on happily to the next life. Right? So in that sense, yeah, we, we say that uh, there's really no such thing as death. The person is reborn. Okay? Alright, let's look at today's sutta and see what the Buddha has to say. Now, the first sutta is 8a. It's called the Arakita Sutta. The discourse on the unguarded. So in this case, this person, the mind is not guarded. Okay? A3.105. The Burmese edition numbering is 109. Eh? And this was also called the Kutagara Sutta 1, the first discourse on the Pinnacle House. It's about the mind affects all our actions. That's the key idea. Okay? Now, these are all familiar teachings. So this teaching is given to us very nicely laid out. It's a reflection. There are many teachings. The Buddha's teaching is very simple. There are many aspects that the Buddha repeats so that we can remember our task is to understand what the Buddha has taught us and to apply this into our daily life. The, the suttas keep repeating themselves because we keep forgetting. So the suttas are constantly reminding us, reminding us. They're like traffic signs. You find the traffic signs repeat themselves all over the place. You, you see a number of traffic lights at one junction, not just one, right? It would be quite risky to have one, so we have quite a number to be safe. So this reputation just for that, to keep us safe. <clears throat> okay, page 159, Arakita Sutta, the discourse on the unguarded. Then the house lord Anatta Pindika approached the Blessed One, Having gone up to the Blessed One, he saluted him and sat down at one side. Okay, this sutta seems to start halfway, no? so it just tells us, well, this will happen. Now, whenever you see the name Ananta Pindika, you almost never see Ananta Pindika asking the Buddha any questions. This is a very famous situation. No? Ananta Pindika, if you know, if you remember, he's the Buddha's foremost supporter. So he feels that he doesn't want to ask the Buddha any question because the Buddha will feel obliged. She has to answer. So he just goes there, is quite happy to listen to the Dhamma. And what the Buddha does is the Buddha will look at him, you know, like any teacher would, and scan his mind. Say, okay, what's he thinking today? You know? 
Of course, you'll be th thinking wholesome things, right? So then the Buddha will choose a subject suitable to his mental state or to whatever query he has in his mind. So on this occasion, the Buddha talks about the guarded mind, right? So notice, the Buddha says, okay, Anathapindika comes to see the Buddha, and then straight away the Buddha teaches him. Section 2. As Anathapindika sat thus at one side, the Blessed One said this to him. Right? Straight away, right? the Buddha teaches him. How's Lord? When the mind is unguarded, then you see the Pali word on the far right hand side, unguarded. Araka, Arakita. Bodily action too is unguarded. Verbal action too is unguarded. Mental action too is unguarded. So here, you have the mind here refers to mindfulness, if you like, intention, right? And then you have the three doors of action, the Abhisankaras, uh, the three kami, Kama formations. When our mind is unwholesome, whatever we express through body, speech and mind are also unwholesome. That's the meaning here. So if that's the case, then we, we can interpret the word mind in the first line to mean intention, chetana. Right? So this is this is what I mean when I often say that early Buddhism tends to be non-technical. So you can see, first line Buddha say mind, and then the fourth line or so, the last line also Buddha says mind. But they're not the same thing, all right? So we've got to ask ourselves, what does the Buddha mean by mind in this line? What does the Buddha mean by, uh, by mind in the last line, all right? Because the mind is a broad term, all right? So the, in the first case, the mind refers to intention. When intention is negative, the three doors, body, speech, and mind, are also negative. If the mind is positive, wholesome, the three doors of action are also, any of the three doors of action also are wholesome. Our intention will decide the moral quality of our actions, in other words. Okay? For one, who, for one whose bodily action is unguarded, whose verbal action is unguarded, whose mental action is unguarded. So here we have three situations, any of these three. Now notice, it can be any of these three. It leads to three more results. That is section four. You, you can read as, wh whose bodily action is unguarded, then his bodily action is unguarded, his verbal action, uh, sorry, uh, defiled rather. His bodily action is defiled too, his verbal action is defiled too, his mental action is defiled too. So in other words, when you act negatively, body, speech and mind also tend to follow. Let's say someone is very violent, right? He's likely to speak violent words also. And his intention definitely is, is, is violent, negative, right? So same thing, then you need the second line in section 3, whose verbal action is unguarded, and then the other three doors also become defiled, become impure. All right? And then mental action, or oh, this is very clear, is the intention. So unguided means we do not see it for what it is, and then hold it back, okay? Restrain it, like restraining the horses. When we don't do that, then the mind becomes defiled. Then the mind takes on the unwholesome color of the intention, okay? That's the meaning of defiled here, avasutta. Then the Buddha, you see here it's cause-effect, cause-effect method, right? A leading to B, B to C, and so on. Five, for one whose bodily action is defiled, notice the word defiled is used here, right? So it builds up from the previous keyword. When the, when whose bodily action is defiled, whose verbal action is defiled, whose mental action is defiled, so here we have, it can be any of this, okay, you use the word or, right? body, speech or mind is defiled. Then the bodily action also is rotten too. Here the Pali word is putika, rotten, okay, in the literal sense of the word. Of course, uh, putika is literal sense of the word, but when we talk about action, it will be metaphorical. His verbal action is rotten too. 
His mental, his verbal action is rotten too. His mental action is rotten too. So here, rotten is a figurative word meaning uh, the results also are bad. Okay. So notice the Buddha talks in a figurative manner here. Now this is not finished yet. So this is number six. Then seven is the result of this of six. For one whose bodily action is rotten, whose verbal action is rotten, whose mental action is rotten, there is no happy death, no happy end of time. Okay? So this is one set of teachings. Right? So you can see very clearly yeah, this is a negative cycle. If someone, I think the keyword here is habitually. If someone habitually thinks negative, thinks violence, thinks uh, push on by negative desire, by uh, hatred, by delusion, then his actions also will follow. And you go on doing like this, then when death comes, it will be negative also. So you see here very clear. There's no mention of last thought. No? Okay, now let's look. Now the Buddha talks on a figurative level. Okay. Why? Is to help us remember this teaching so that we put it into action when the time comes. See, the problem is, you know, temples have doors. The moment we step out of the doors, we leave everything behind in the temple. We forget the teaching. Eh? We, we should bring home the teaching. We should change. We should go through this change when we listen to the Dhamma. So we are challenged when we go out into the world. There's nothing wrong with the world. It's how we look at the world. Okay? Right? Remember this famous saying in a Nibedika Sutta? But the Buddha said, the world is as it is. Okay? It's neither good nor bad. It's how we look at the world. Okay? I put all the Buddha lives in the world. Right? The Buddha is here to teach us how to keep our minds clear and calm with goodness, with wholesomeness. So, section 9, the Buddha tells Anatta Pindika, house lord, just as when a pinnacle house is ill touched so you have this sloping house, right? So if it is not properly attached, those uh, old ancient days in the kampongs, even today, you know, some, some places, the house is attached. You actually see they use leaves, right? From, from some kind of plant, nipa palms usually. The leaves are attached together, woven together, in, in, in Asia especially, in, in South Asia, Southeast Asia. And they, they, the leaves slope downwards, so the rainwater will just flow down. So they have to touch the leaves. They, they bend the leaves halfway across a, like a, a stick, a pole, and then they stitch it, you know, or they, they kind of hold it together with a little piece of uh, stick. You know? uh, that comes from the rib of the leaf also, by the way. So it's, it's kind of overlaps, and they do it like a double layers, so, and then they, they overlap the leaves, so the rainwater will just flow over it. Of course, if there's a typhoon, too bad, because the typhoon is very strong, it will blow the, the roof upwards, then you have problems. But it's worse if the roof are not properly attached, they are not properly tied down, they, they are a little bit far apart, the rainwater will go in. Right? So, house lord, just when a pinnacle house is ill attached, okay, so the Pali word is duchana. Chana means covered, duchana means poorly covered. Uh, ill touch. Then the, the pinnacle is unprotected too. Right, the pinnacle is the top part which is sloping. Then the rafters, the, the, the pillars are also unprotected. That means rainwater will fall under them. The walls also will get wet in the storm. The, the walls are unprotected. The audience knows that they know this very well because their houses are like that. So they're going to take home this teaching. They say, wow, yeah, that's true, you know. We all have to touch our own houses properly. Otherwise, the water goes in and it damages the house. Ten. The pinnacle is drenched or becomes rotten too. 
tinta. Yeah? The rafters are drenched too. The walls are drenched too. Now why it's not said here, what happens to the walls in the house when they are drenched? They will collapse. Things get spoiled. Right? So even so, right? When we see even so, the Buddha is connecting the parable to real life. Even so, house lord, when the mind, house lord, is unguarded, bodily action to is unguarded, verbal action to is unguarded, mental action to is unguarded. So now the Buddha links everything back. He repeats what he has said earlier on. Okay? So this is a lesson. People listening, everything is told at least twice so they don't forget. For one whose bodily action is unguarded, whose verbal action is unguarded, whose mental action is unguarded, the other three doors, body, speech and mind, also become defiled, become impure. And when the body, speech and mind are defiled, they are impure, then section 15, they are also rotten. The results are also bad. They bring bad results. And then all this will end up with an unhappy death. There's no happy end of time. So this is the person who's living a very unwholesome life, right? The mind is always negative. So the sutta, as a rule, begins with something dreadful, something not happy, and then ends with something happy. Right? Now the guarded mind, section 18. House Lord, when the mind, house Lord, is guarded, rakito, rakita or rakito, bodily action too is guarded, verbal action too is guarded, mental action too is guarded. You got your mind? All the three doors are guarded. Okay? Notice here the Buddha keeps calling house lord, house lord, right? So this is to make sure the audience is listening, okay? So the, the Buddha repeats big shoes, big shoes, and monks or, or laymen and so on. Okay? Sometimes be named Ananda, right? So this is uh, the way the Buddha holds the attention of the audience. And then the meaning is the Buddha is addressing the world through. The house lord through Anatta Pindika, the Buddha is addressing us right here today. That's why it's such joy to study the suttas. You, you get this, it's like this message the Buddha has written us. Okay, now we're going to look at this message. This, the Buddha has written us a whole, many volumes of letters. We have to start reading them, you know. So these are like letters from India 2,500 years ago. Section 19. For one whose bodily action is guarded, whose verbal action is guarded, whose mental action is guarded, these three doors of action are undefiled, so that they are protected from negative bad karma, anavasata. And for one whose bodily action, verbal action, mental action are undefiled, not impure, then these three doors of action uh, are not rotten, right? The, the result also is, is not, not bad. Eh? You know, it's, it's good. The suttas often use uh, negative language. Okay? It's not rotten, that means it's good, right? For finally, 23, for one whose bodily action is not rotten, whose verbal action is not rotten, whose mental action is not rotten, there is a happy death, the end of time. A happy end of time. Yeah? So notice here, the Buddha didn't say happy rebirth, they said happy end of time, happy death. It means happy rebirth, of course, in this case. The Buddha is talking about this life, right? Of course, happy death entails happy rebirth, right? Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything, right? And the Buddha wouldn't say, that's the end of it, no? That would be a nihilistic idea, right? So it refers to happy rebirth also. Then there's a parable here. The parable is the well touch pinnacle house. House lot, just as when the pinnacle house is well touched, suchanna, okay, well covered. 
The pinnacle is protected too. The rafters are protected too. Its walls are protected too. Now here you can see everything nicely, one line, a sentence, a phrase, quite easy to see on the eye. No? Some translation they want to save a bit, uh, space, but everything in one line, that can be quite difficult to read. Right? So here, it's like almost like a picture reading, no? so it's easier to look at this, especially for the teacher. When the teacher teaches, it's easy for him to follow the ideas too. So the pinnacle, the, the V shape, the A shape roof, the rafters, the, the, the beams, and the walls, they are also protected, dry and comfortable, and you stay inside safely, right? So the pinnacle, the rafters, and the walls are not rotten. See, because if water gets in, the walls and the pillars get rotten, they can collapse any time. It's very dangerous. 27. Even so, house lord, when the mind, house lord, is guarded, bodily action, verbal action, mental action, too, are guarded. And when body, speech, and mind are guarded, they are also undefiled. They, don't, they are not impure, they are undefiled. And since the three doors are undefiled, they are not rotten, right? So they, they do not bring bad karma, they bring good karma, then there is a happy death, a happy end of time, right? So there you are. It's a simple reminder for us to keep our mind positive, a mind free from greed, free from hatred, free from delusion. That's the meaning here, okay? So it's a short reflection to remind us that it's how we think that affects all our other actions. So think positive, right? So, do reflect on this teaching and learn to be happy, learn to be peaceful within yourself. Then you will be happy, positive and helpful to others when they need you. Now the second, let us now go on to look at 8b, ST48.8b, Avyapana Sutta, the discourse on the defile, A3.106, also called the Kutagara Sutta 2. Uh, okay, the translation is next page 163. Then Anatta Pindika, the house lord, approached the Blessed One, having gone up to the Blessed One. He saluted him and then sat down at one side. As Anatta Pindika was sitting at one side, the Blessed One said this to him. Okay, now we're not sure whether this is another occasion or it could be the same occasion. Remember, uh, this document is retold to us, handed down to us by ancient storytellers. So, he added in this paragraph to help us have a narrative, uh, what do you call that? We, we know the background, the narrative background of the story, right? So, it could be immediately after the previous sutta, then the Buddha goes on to teach this. You know, I'm sure the Buddha has not talked for quite a long time, right? It doesn't matter. The important thing to us is we have this teaching with us. So, let's look at session two, the defiled mind. House Lord, when the mind is defiled, bodily action is defiled too, verbal action is defiled too, mental action is defiled too. For one whose body, bodily action is defiled, whose verbal action is defiled, whose mental action is defiled, there is no happy death, no happy end of time. Right, so here the Buddha straight away starts, you can see, actually it starts with the ending of the, of the previous sutta. Uh, the, the, uh, Rakita Sutta A three point one o five, which was in, which was uh, Sutta number eight A. No? So this person whose mind is unwholesome will die unhappy also. And then the parable is the same: ill-touched pinnacle house. Suppose how lo house lord when a pinnacle ho house is ill-touched, its pinnacle is defiled too, its rafters are defiled too, its walls are defiled too. 
even so house lord when the mind is defiled bodily action is defiled to verbal actions defiled to mental action is defiled too so when our body speech and mind are not pure or to be very simply when the mind intention is unwholesome there is no happy death then the opposite the undefiled mind okay here the mind is undefiled body speech and mind are also undefiled and when the three doors of action are undefiled in other words pure free of greed hatred delusion there is happy death notice again here the buddha simply says you live well you die well right there's no mention of the last thought moment right so the momentum of your goodness will happily bring you over to the other side so this is like the well attached pinnacle house the house is well attached so rain does not get in the roof the pil- the beams and the walls are all protected dry and strong to pr- to protect the inhabitants the people who live inside this is like when our mind our intentions are wholesome our body speech and mind are wholesome then there is a happy death right so you can see although the sutta appears not to be connected with the theme of death the last line connects this teaching to this common theme of this volume okay now both the suttas the the kutagara suttas a3.105 3106 they actually have been summarized in dhammapada verses 1 and 2 you can see the two verses on page 156 no? the famous twin verses right you can see at 112 where the buddha says the mind precedes all mental states Okay what does mind here mean the mind here is intention right the mind is supreme mind made are they right so mind made means the intention decides the quality of our action if with a defiled mind here the pali word is padute na one speaks or acts suffering follows one like a wheel that dogs a draft ox's foot So notice here this four lines actually summarizes the whole sutta no? the the first part of the sutta this is a negative aspect okay now the second verse is a positive aspect wholesome aspect the mind precedes all wholesome states right? here mind is mano okay now, there's another problem here is that the word the buddha uses citta okay mano and sometimes the buddha would list mano citta with jnana all together but mano and citta often get interchanged right vijnana normally is used in a sense of consciousness right so again here remember the early buddhist texts are not technical in that sense so you got to find out you got to tease out the meaning for yourself all right so the mind precedes all mental states so this is the same as the previous verse the mind is supreme mind made are they so line a and b are the same as in the previous sutta but the next the closing two lines are different if with a pure mind so pure mind pasanena the pasanena also means bright with faith happy joyful one speaks or acts happiness follows one like a shadow that leaves not right so here the, the shadow is uh, used in a happy sense your shadow never leaves you and you only see your shadow in the light so it's used in a positive sense no so here it also means that when you do good you are happy conversely when you're happy you tend to do good so it's very important to be happy in that sense to be joyful look at the bright side of things to remember the good things people have done for us that we know of this person then we will be happy and positive too so this is a very short and very helpful sutta okay